Standing seam metal roofing is a great choice for hurricane prone areas like Florida, the Caribbean, other places like that because it's tested, engineered, and proven to withstand high winds, hurricane force winds, wind driven rain. So if you're an installer and you want to know the best practices, the best testing, the best engineering for areas like that, keep watching this video. That's what we're talking today on the Metal Roofing Channel. What's up guys, welcome to the Metal Roofing Channel. I'm Thad Barnett and welcome to Q&A Mondays. Today we are talking about hurricane prone areas, what testing um, is used to test the metal roofing systems that go in areas like that, and what are some best practices when it comes to actually installing those roofing systems. You can jump ahead to any of the questions that we talk about today. Down in the description below, there are quick links. You can jump ahead to any of those. And make sure you subscribe here. We release metal roofing and metal construction content every Monday and Wednesday. Well, today we have Jeff Hawk, Technical Director for Sheffield Metals, back with us. And Jeff, we're going to talk a little bit about hurricane prone areas. And you know a thing or two about this for sure, not only from your experience with Sheffield um, and your experience in general, but also you live in Florida. So why don't you tell us a little bit about hurricane prone areas and what that means for metal roof installation. When it comes to metal roofing and hurricane prone areas, again, not every metal roof is going to be suitable, you know, to meet these high wind speeds. It all goes back to testing. It all goes to what wind speeds you have to design to and what design pressure that means that you need to meet and in in the test standards that you have to apply by. So, you know, again, you know, using Florida as an example, and Florida really sets the tone for most hurricane prone areas or areas that get high winds and things like that. Um, there's different testing requirements based on whether or not you are in a, they call them HVHZ, high velocity hurricane zones, whether you're not in a high velocity hurricane zone. And then, you know, as most people know in the industry, Miami-Dade has their own set of rules uh, for their counties. In short, yes, metal roofing is a great choice for hurricane prone areas if it is manufactured to meet those uh, geographic locations that you're installing it in. So what kind of standards exist to meet the requirements of those hurricane prone areas? Okay, so we'll, again, we'll use Florida for the example. When it comes to uplift testing, uh, most of the time to get an engineering report and things like that, you test one specimen over a certain panel over a certain substrate. So let's say it's a inch and three quarter, 18 inch wide panel that's made out of galvalume steel, 24 gauge, and it's tested over um, a half inch plywood deck. That would be sufficient enough for most areas of the country that aren't, you know, going to get beat up by hurricanes and things like that. When you get into hurricane prone areas and you need to meet the requirements in those areas, now you move into basically what they call TAS 125 tests. So you take, it's a combination of three UL 580 tests, the test, the test uh, specimens that we talked about originally. So Try to try to make this so it's easy to understand. You've got to do two field specimens and a corner specimen. Your field specimen is usually your clip spacing that's a little further apart, say two foot. And that's what's going to be used over the majority of your roof. Uh, and then you have to test a corner specimen. And the corner specimen is going to be where you have your tightest clip spacing, uh, say six inches. Um, so you'll have a really high design pressure in your corner zone. You'll have a good design pressure in your field zone and the engineers are able to do calculations uh, based on those two numbers at different spacings. So as we talked about before in our FBC wind speed video, uh, you have three different parts of a roof. You have your corners, which take the highest pressure uh, of any wind. You have your perimeters, which go around your eaves, your ridge, basically anywhere there's an edge of your roof. And then you have the field, which is the body of your roof. And all three of those pressures can be different. So using the corner pressures and the two field spacings, and they, the reason they make you do two field spacings is so they can give an average accurate number. Um, you can help determine what your clip spacing needs to be in those different zones of the roof to meet the wind speeds that are gonna be in the area that uh, you're building in. So that's just on the uplift side. Uh, for water penetration or wind-driven rain testing, uh, most of the time you can get away with a water penetration test and we've shown that in videos before where it has the sprinklers and it shoots water down on the roof and they put pressure on it to have it suck in and 
if it doesn't uh, if it doesn't have any water coming underneath the metal panels, you pass. Uh, with TAS 100 or wind driven rain testing, they have this. You have to build a mock up of a roof. It has a valley. It has different flashing conditions on it. It has Z closures and actual trim. They have this huge prop airplane engine that they take and they kick this up and it is blowing wind and water and really driving that rain into the system. And I believe it simulates 8.8 .8 inches of rainfall an hour at wind speeds up to 110 miles an hour. So that is driving rain, hurricane force wind, uh, driving that rain. And again, you know, you can't have a drop of water come through the panels into the deck and that's a requirement. That's a quite a bit more harsh than a, uh, a sprinkler test. And the other test that's probably, you know, not going to see too commonly required except in these areas is uh, ASTM E 1886, which is large missile impact. Bait flying debris, hurricanes pick up a lot of stuff and next thing you know, things are flying through the air that shouldn't be. So basically what they do is they take this air cannon with a two by four in it. They mark, I believe, three specific spots on a uh, test deck as well, uh, built up of the assembly that you're testing and they fire this two by four uh, at the test decks to make sure it can't penetrate through the roofing system. So those are probably, you know, the three most common standards that you'll see that you won't typically see in non-hurricane zones because, you know, the, the requirement just isn't there. But, um, the, you know, the additional testing on uplifts, the uh, extent of how the wind-driven rain is being tested, and then, again, shooting a two by four at a roof, uh, you know, if it passes all that, you, you know what you're getting when they put that roof system on. And we've had questions like, uh, you know, what's the recommended clip spacing for those areas and different things like that. But it's not as simple as just saying, oh, it should be this. It depends on the panel, depends on the location, depends on the building itself, depends on the, the parts of the building. Like you said, the corner versus the field. You might have different clip spacings for for whatever, you know, there, there might be a lot of different things. So it all comes back to that testing and making sure that you're following the engineering and the testing that's required for that area based on the system and the building that you choose. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, you could have two buildings side by side, one's 10 feet off the ground, one's 40 feet off the ground. They're gonna require, they're gonna have different requirements just based on the building design, you know, cause one's so much higher, one's so much lower. Um, you know, the wind speed you might need to meet in one area 100 miles away might be 20, 20 uh, miles per hour lower. You know, it, again, it really depends on your geographic location. Clip spacing is obviously a huge one. Um, you know, panel width, you know, usually the more narrow the panel, the more the stronger it is because it doesn't have as much of a flat area to deflect. Uh, you know, there's, there's a ton of things that go into it. Um, so that's why you know, they do have the testing to see how it performs. And, and that's why it's important if you do live in one of those hurricane prone areas, uh, you know, you need to have calculations done and you need to have the proper testing done. You know, if there is no one size fits all answer, you know, go at 16 inches, you'll be fine for as far as clip spacing, you know, it really comes down to your building design, yeah. your location and the system that you want to use. Yeah. And if you're unsure as an installer, you really need to be in contact with a manufacturer because they're going to know what panels they have tested, what systems they have tested, what components need to go into those systems. Because at the end of the day, some panels perform differently than other panels. Some perform better, some don't perform as, as well. So the manufacturer is going to know that and they're going to know uh, what, what panels and what systems are going to perform for those areas based on what they've tested. Yeah, absolutely correct. And I highly suggest doing that before you either bid a job or before you, you know, I, definitely before you start installing, but ideally before you bid a job, to make sure you can meet it. Because, you know, you put a bid out there, your bid gets accepted, and then you find out that that panel that you planned on using isn't going to work. Well, that could very much affect your bid and uh, the cost that you have in, you know, built into the job. So, you know, it's, it's a, lot easier, um, a lot easier to do a little bit of work beforehand than it is to try to scramble after the fact. Yeah, and what if you're an architect designing a building and designing a standing seam metal roof in a hurricane-prone area? Do you have any advice for, for them as they're putting their designs together? Well, one of the things I've been seeing a lot lately of, and I, and I absolutely love it because it makes my job easier, is, uh, you know, a lot of times, you know, construction plans and things like that, roof plans, they will, uh, they'll tell you what wind speed you need to meet. 
um, unless you're an engineer, you, you know, you can't really do those calculations and, and, you know, say that it's, you know, nothing to worry about. Uh, but what I've been seeing a lot lately is uh, they've been including those design pressures for zone one, two, and three. So if you know those right off the bat, before you're going into a bid, it makes everybody's job easier as far as determining whether or not the panel you're proposing to bid is going to meet the requirements set forth by the architect. It takes all the guesswork out of it. Does A match B? So we know that manufacturers will provide information on approved details when it comes to engineering, tested systems, clip spacing, stuff like that. But what about other components of, of the roof? Is that included, like underlayment? Talk to me about underlayment. Is that part of the, the factor as well? Does, does that talk about, is that included in engineering? Do you manufacturers have certain uh, underlayments that they recommend for, for certain areas? Talk to me about that. A manufacturer 90% of the time is gonna have a manu uh, underlayment that they uh, prefer or recommend. As far as testing goes, you have to test, you have to use what you tested with or something better. So if you test with a peel and stick underlayment, you cannot go and put a synthetic underlayment on when you put the actual roof on the building. Uh, you know, at Sheffield, we test everything with 30 pound felt paper. It's basically the minimum requirements you can have for uh, underlayment. So if we decide that this project would, you know, perform a lot better with a peel and stick underlayment, we can and it doesn't affect our engineering at all. Um, same thing with a synthetic underlayment, you know, we could, you can always go up. You can't go down as far as the quality of products used in your, um, you know, your engineering. Same thing as if you test the panel at two foot on center. You can use your clips at 12 inches on center and the testing is still valid. You can't go at 36 inches on center and have your testing still be valid. You know, you can always do more. You can't do less. So um, as far as underlayment goes, you know, it, it really depends on what they tested, how they tested and what they tested with. Um, a lot of people in Florida that test specific for Florida will use a peel and stick underlayment because they, you know that's the market that they're going after. But uh, if you're Sheffield Metals and you know you're you're doing testing that you know we like to be able to apply to the whole country, you know we try to test at the minimums and uh, we can always up the system as need be. If I'm a homeowner and I want to buy a new metal roof for my house and I live in a hurricane prone area. What do I do to make sure I'm choosing the right contractor and someone that I know is going to install, you know, the right roof that will that will withstand uh, the weather in my area? How do I know that they're going to make sure that they they follow those those guidelines, those best practices? You know, you have your standard ways of reviewing contractors. You have reviews. You can go talk to people that they've worked for before. Um, you know, contractors should be pulling permits. You know, so I mean, to me, a red flag number one is if you're not pulling a permit. Um, you know, they should be licensed and insured. You know, it's, it's, it's basically all the things that you would do if you're looking for uh, a regular contractor in, in, in anywhere. Um, but then you can bring up the questions as far as, you know, meeting the building codes that are local to your areas. What's the wind speed we need to meet? Does the product that you're proposing meet the uh, wind speeds that are being requested in my area? And if they're a contractor from that area, they should be able to answer all these questions pretty quick. Um, they know what they know what products and assemblies they have that work because they're working in that area all the time. Um, the the customers are aware of it, you know, because they live there. They know what kind of weather they get. So um, I think as long as you go for a quality roofing contractor, just like you would want on any job, uh, and, and pose this question specific to your area, whether it be Florida or Texas or anywhere that gets hurricanes or, uh, you know, high wind speeds, uh, you know, those are all questions you can bring up and see how they answer them. You know, and if they, if they are able to have the answers for you right off the bat, that's usually a good sign that they know what they're talking about and that they've, uh, they've been dealing with this once or twice. And when it comes to details like drip edges, valleys, ridge details, you know, what are some recommendations? What, what should people be using? Talk to me about that. So we always recommend following the manufacturer's recommended details. Um, and especially if you're in an area where say you're getting a TAS 100 test where we talked about the wind driven rain and you're actually building that assembly and adding those trim pieces in. Uh, when you do that test and you get the report and the evaluation, all the installation details used in that assembly have been submitted. So those details, obviously, you know, are going to perform per that test. 
Now, they're usually the manufacturer's recommended details because it would, wouldn't make much sense to have two sets of details. But, um, you know, the manufacturer has the details that they recommend because they believe it's going to perform with their product. Uh, if, there, if it wasn't going to perform with their product, you know, then obviously it probably wouldn't be recommended. Uh, you know, we do things, you know, our recommended details, you know, we have more fasteners in certain places, mainly along your drip edge and your ridge uh, for butyl tape sealing and things like that. And I mean, honestly, if your Eve comes unhooked, then, you know, the rest of your roof system is probably going to go along with it. So we, we, I won't say overkill, but we uh, engineer properly for what we feel is good practices. But the manufacturer is usually going to have his recommended details, and that's what we always suggest following. If you have any more questions about hurricane prone areas, best practices, engineering, please leave them in the comments below. We'd love to answer them. Make sure you subscribe here to the Metal Roofing channel. As always, I'm Thad Barnett. We'll catch you next time.